If you'd like to know how you can scale service design in a sustainable way and how the role of service designers is changing, keep watching because these are the topics I'm going to discuss with the guest of this episode. Hi, I'm Louise and this is the Service Design Show. Hi guys, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome to a brand new episode of the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to create more human-centered businesses. And the way we do it is by studying the success of some of the world's best service designers. On the show we talk about topics ranging from design thinking and creative leadership to organizational change and customer experience. If these are the topics you're interested in, be sure to know that we bring a brand new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you don't want to miss anything, click that subscribe button. My guest in this episode is Louise Down. Louise is the director of design within the UK government. And for the next 30 minutes or so, Louise and I will be talking about these two topics. How do we scale service design in a sustainable way? And why do we need to rethink the role of a service designer? If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide down below in the description, or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. And in case you prefer to listen to a podcast version of this episode, head over to servicedesignshow.com slash podcast where you'll find this episode and all the previous ones. For now, let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Louise. Hi. So happy to have you on uh, this evening in Utrecht or uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's evening in London. You're based in London, right? I am, yeah, in uh, sunny Whitechapel, you can see yeah, it, sunny uh, white the sun is shining. <laughs> Louise, the first question I ask everyone that comes onto the show is, do you recall your very first encounter with service design? I do, yeah, I, I, I probably had a, a similarly revelationary moment to a lot of people uh, who kind of moved into the practice from doing something else. Um, I was a uh, producer at the Tate Gallery, uh, and I, my job was essentially making the um, uh, in-gallery interpretation materials. So, uh, you know, kind of uh, mobile tours, uh, videos, um, uh, things stuck on the wall to help people to understand uh, artworks uh, at the Tate Gallery. And uh, one day, I was going to the gallery to test. Um, a new uh, audio tour that I had just made and um, it was one of the first ones that you could just download onto your phone um, or just simple uh, videos uh, on an HTML site so it was fully accessible. Um, really excited about this kind of new way of providing a mobile tour and then walked into the gallery to find a big sticker uh, on uh, the outside of the, the gallery saying please don't use your mobile phones. <laughs> and I, I, I sort of thought to myself, God, this is insane. Like how, how can we not be designing all of these things at once? And um, there must be some form of design where you design everything at the same time rather than one thing separately to another thing and then started Googling. Hmm. I thought I invented service design because I was like, I'm sure there's a designing something as a service. Um, and then, you know, kind of uh, that's where it started and I, I moved into service design from there. So this must have been back in 2004, something like that? Or uh, even uh, earlier? Is it, when was that? <laughs> yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, in the early days of service design, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Louise, uh, we have two topics that we will talk about in the next uh, 25 minutes and uh, super interesting topics. Uh, we'll be co-creating the questions as we go along. So um, yeah, the main question is, are you ready? I am ready. All right. Let me pick the first topic and I've got it over here. <clears throat> and this topic is called sustainable scaling. Uh, can you make a question related to this? So uh, I suppose my question related to this is, uh, I guess, a sort of how might we uh, kind of question, because it's it's something that I think um, uh, potentially as an organi organization who has been working on service design here um, in the UK government, but also as an industry, it's something that we're starting to um, find is an issue that we need to think about. And that's how do we uh, go beyond um purely trying to kind of get people to believe that service design is an important thing to actually scaling that um, across a very large organization um, and actually making that sustainable over time so that we're not just designing the service once, but the service um, is repeatedly uh, designed and iterated live and in the open. Um, the, the, UK the holy grail. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think it's a kind of 
I've heard a lot of people talking about what um, what it means for service design to be growing up, and I think we're we're definitely in that space um, here in, in government. And I think it's an interesting topic for um, uh, for probably the industry to to kind of think and talk about a little bit as well. So yeah, what what are your findings so far? What is uh, what what isn't and is working related to scaling service design? So I think uh, one of the things that we realized very early on um, in terms of scaling service design was that as an organization, um, GDS is at the very uh, kind of heart of government. So we're part of the cabinet office, which is an organization that essentially helps government to uh, design and deliver better services. Um, so we realized uh, about uh, a year ago that actually the right approach to scaling um, better services across government wasn't to put a full agile team on every single service from GDS, um, but that our approach should be to enable the rest of government to design and deliver better services. So we've taken um, a number of different kind of tacks to that, um, one of which um, being um, massively trying to increase the number of service designers in uh, government. So we've gone from something like 50 um, two years ago to uh, over 800 uh, service designers um, and interaction designers and graphic designers across government and 10 heads of design uh, in different departments across government. So we've seen massive growth in that time, um, which has been brilliant. But one of the things that, that comes from massive growth is, is then having to share um, standards and patterns and ways of working so we then sort of have kind of taken our focus from from that and obviously we're still focused on um, uh, building that community but to supporting that community to work on shared patterns so um, we have been building a, a design system um, which is a kind of uh, based on some uh, prototype versions that we've had running for a very long time that share patterns um, that will help people to be able to contribute um, uh, to the way that designs um, should be kind of implemented in services. So if one person in one department comes up with one way of asking a question about um, sex and gender, that another uh, service team in the Department of Government are able to use that pattern and put it into their service very easily because that service, uh, that pattern itself rather, is uh, fully coded. So it's, it's just an element uh, they can add to their service. Um, and focusing on also a way of those patterns being um, uh, iterated as well by their community, because the last thing we want to do as the GDS design team is to stipulate what standards people uh, work on when actually we're not as close to services as everyone else is. So um, we've been doing a lot of effort into making sure that those uh, that uh, design system is easy to contribute to as it is easy to consume the patterns uh, in that, that product. And um, super interesting because I think there aren't that many standards related to service design um, and, and services in general. The question that came up to my mind related to scaling is what you hear often is when agencies scale, it's really hard to keep the culture um, of the agency. Uh, is, how, is that an issue uh, that you see happening? So scaling from uh, how many, 50 to 800? How do you make sure that people share the same core beliefs, same values? Um, so one of the things actually we did very, very early on um, uh, when GDS was first founded five years ago was to create the design principles. Um, so uh, that's a set of principles. I think it's now been translated into uh, 30 different languages. Um, there are many governments across the, the world using those principles. And, and the first one of those principles says start with user needs. Um, and that has those things have really formed a foundation on which a culture has kind of um, been built. And mm. people, um, I, you know, I kind of like to ask people in interviews, um, you know, whether or not they're okay working on a black and white website, um, because ultimately, Gov.uk UK and the services that are on there are not, you know, the most visually interesting things in the world, and uh, neither should they be. But we find that designers don't um, join government uh, to work on, you know, kind of beautiful, creative um, things. They they join to solve a problem. So they're already um, part of a group of people who feel very dedicated to a movement and feel very de dedicated to public service. So thankfully, mm -hmm. there's an existing culture around public service that, that is already in the civil service now anyway. Um, but we do an awful lot of things to make sure that that, that culture of the design team um, stays uh, strong. So we have regular meetups uh, every eight weeks where we get guest speakers in um, and we get people to show their work. 
we've also got our mailing list that's got something like um, 4,000 people on at the moment, so more than just those 800 designers. There's more people in, interested in design than there are people who are actually designers, which is great. Um, and that has, you know, kind of daily questions of people, you know, kind of saying, um, I'm designing a service that is, uh, you know, kind of, uh, looking to uh, help people to, um, you know, kind of come to the UK and stay. Has anyone uh, had any experience uh, on working with uh, people who are migrating to a, a new place? Um, and people will start sharing their experience around those things. So um, a lot of the, the tech that we use is very old school in terms of kind of sharing. So it's things like meetups and mailing lists. Um, but they work because we can never predict the types of technology that people are using in the civil service because it's so big. So, um, yeah, we, we certainly put a lot of effort into making that community feel as if it's a strong community that people want to be part of. Yeah, and I think that there's the key. I'm really interested to learn more about that because... Um, what I see a lot with uh, people creating patterns or standards is that, you know, you put up a website or you document something and you, it's one off effort and it's really hard to keep that alive and to make sure that people use that, mm. right? You, you contribute up front and, and then nobody uses it. You document it really well and then nobody uses it. How, how do we go about solving that issue? Yeah, well, so we have a number of different um, uh, controls uh, the, to make sure that services actually are consistent across government. So um, uh, GDS has control of uh, spending uh, in IT um, across government. We also have control over uh, what services get added to uh, Gov.uk. Um, so in order to do to go on to Gov.uk, a service must uh, show that it's using design patterns. So it's actually intrinsically baked into the way that... Um, stuff is published and things are worked on but more more than that i think there's as i was saying the, the culture of the designers who join government don't join to you know kind of um make amazingly kind of uh you know sort of personally creative decisions about what color a service should be they join to solve a problem so actually when it comes to the use of patterns most people want to use those patterns because they would rather spend their time solving a really important problem than figuring out a, a new way to do a radio checkbox because it's already been figured out and no one needs to or needs to or wants to do that more than once. So, um, so, yeah. so the, the uh, sort of the selection um, of the people working uh, in, in your agency is, you know, is the key to success, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I always I like to think of it as a kind of mixture uh, between kind of idealism and, and pragmatism. Uh, you know, people have to be idealistic about what it is they want to achieve and, and uh, making services better for users but they have to be pragmatic about how they get there. Um, and I think that that kind of rings true for, for you know, the majority of the, the 800 um, people working in design across government is that we wouldn't be here unless we wanted to do something um, really radical to make uh, the lives of users better. Um, but you don't go into government with any kind of um, uh, probably false sense of the fact that, you know, um, that's not going to be a slow process potentially and be difficult. And um, for all the right reasons that, that government is very risk averse because it has to look after people, it doesn't mean, mean that it's quite a difficult place to work uh, sometimes for designers. So I think it's a temperament that, of people who, who join um, that kind of work in that way. So, so um, sort of wrapping up this topic, what what kind of challenges do you foresee related to scaling in the next two three years? Mm. So I think one of the um, the biggest challenges that we have actually um, is just the pure um, scale of the of the task actually. Um, so uh, there are about four thousand services uh, in uh, across uh, UK central government. Um, we're actually the oldest and largest service provider in the UK, um, and there are 500,000 people working in civil service. So we are uh, at, at sort of 3,000 people uh, in total doing user research, design and content, about 0.5% of the civil service. So we're very, very small in comparison to kind of uh, where we need to be. And what we're seeing is actually that the uh, there aren't enough people in universities uh, or who want to move into service design at the moment uh, to, to bring us up to the nut, the scale that we need to be. So we're doing an awful lot of work with the universities and, and much, much earlier with schools to encourage um, people to get into service design and particularly design in the public sector. Um, because we just simply can't uh, kind of uh, work with the current kind of uh, group of people who are out there. Um, equally, we have uh, real problems finding people with the right type of skills, and I'll maybe talk about that in, in the next um, kind of section. But um, 
the the service design market doesn't have the type of skills that we're looking for um, most of the time. Um, but I think equally, you know, on the flip side of it, not just scale, sustainability is a, re- a really big um, issue as well. And so um, it means that our service designers have to think about how the things that they make get implemented. Um, so all of our designers can code. Um, it's really important that if they're working um on uh, you know kind of uh, something that goes on the internet that they understand how the internet works it's a bit like being a carpenter if you didn't understand how wood worked then um, you would be in trouble (laughs) so for a service designer who's working on digital things you have to know how how digital works so um, we're 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 finding that kind of um, dealing with sustainability dealing with something that rather than trying to design the future designing things that can be designed in the future um, is actually a task that means that we need to get into very detailed conversations about how technically things work. So um, we need people who don't have an aversion to kind of getting their hands dirty and talking about code and about data and, and other things. Hmm. Interesting. Let's let's use your opening uh, and move on to the second topic because you said something about people having the right skills and uh, that you require maybe different skills than are typically asked for in the market. So um, the second topic we can talk about um, is called the role. And again, can you formulate a question around this one? Uh, So good good question, asking a question around that. Um, So my question would be, um, is the current understanding in the service design industry of what a service designer does uh, fit for purpose uh, and fit for the future of what service design is and becoming. So let's really find what a service designer is. (laughs) Let's go. (laughs) Right, let's do it now. Um, So I I sort of touched on it a little bit earlier, um, but um, service design in government is a very embedded practice. Uh, So our our designers are working in multidisciplinary agile teams. They work with developers, um, user researchers, uh, delivery managers, product managers, to um, really just understand what a service uh, should be, to uh, write down into the implementation of that thing and how that thing works, how that thing is operated and, you know, kind of uh, run in a sustainable way. Um, What I've found is that um, the history of service design is very much a kind of um, uh, agency-based role. And I certainly know this from having come from agencies, uh, a lot of what you're taught and encouraged to uh, kind of hone in terms of your practice in an agency is actually your skills of facilitation and of presentation and making really nice diagrams (laughs) and slide decks uh, to prove your point. And with us, actually, we don't need to do a vast majority of that because we're working with an embedded team that's already bought in. I'm not saying there isn't, you know, a fair bit of facilitation that goes on with more complicated, you know, contentious decisions um, and that diagramming isn't, you know, occasionally important. But we need our service designers to actually be able to design a service. And one thing I find actually quite frightening is that when I talk to people in interviews about service design and I ask them, what is a service? What do you think service design is? I get an hour's worth of response. And to me and to government, a service is something that helps someone to do something and service design is the design of services. And unless someone can understand that and can be able to actually physically design a service, then I can't employ them as a service designer. And that's a real problem for us because, you know, as I said, we have, we're dealing with massive scale here. We we need people with those skills and yet um, universities are not, seemingly teaching those skills um, they, they, their perception of industry is still very much based on the skills that are needed by agencies um, agencies themselves when um, designers go from university to an agency environment their skills get completely warped um, into the type of thing that an agency needs and we're actually just finding that you know after five ten years of working in an agency a, a designer just isn't able to kind of change their mindset mm-hmm. and, and actually think well Maybe I should learn to code. <laughs> so it, it's the, the delivery, actual delivery of what you've designed. Right? Yeah. The delivery is part of the design process, right? Completely, and, <clears throat> and it should be. And, and it comes back to that point about sustainability, because unless we're building, um, unless we're designing at the coal face of delivery in the long term, we're, we're going to design services now and then in five years' time, 
find that those things are as failing as they are now because we haven't iterated them over time. And that's, you know, that actually iteration is the real test of, of a good a good design that lasts, um, not, not how well it, it performed when it first came out. And so yeah. we need designers that can work with developers that aren't afraid of um, getting into the detail of something. But also um, we need people who are very critical um, and understand that actually uh, their role as a designer is often um, as an ambassador for users and um, that, you know, if, if technology asks, asks the question of what can be done, then design often asks the question of well, what should be done. Um, and unfortunately, you know, practical um, uh, delivery skills um, and uh, criticality are both things that are not um, either encouraged by the agency world or encouraged by universities, um, unfortunately, at the moment. So hence a lot of our service designers are not from a design background. Um, we have a lot of artists and we have a lot of uh, people from social sciences and um, they moved into design in, in their later careers, but they weren't initially taught in design. I think that that's potentially a real testament to, to where design education needs to go in, in the future to support, I think, an increasing industry where service design is moving in-house um, because it's very difficult to perform uh, the type of uh, you know improvements to a service that you need to when you're in an agency. So, yeah, you don't have actually the access to change processes to change stuff, right? That's that's the challenge I think a lot of agencies face that they get to the point where they get to the conceptualization of a service and then sort of there is a really big gap how to follow up on that and you don't have that gap. You, no. No, and, and and I don't think that that gap, that gap should should exist. And and in, in a way, I mean, it's, it's. I mean, I used to work for agencies before I I was brought into government and um, to kind of build service design as a thing. And part of the reason why I was keen to leave was because um, I was in the same situation as most people in agencies. I, I had uh, spent the last you know kind of uh, six years basically creating um, PowerPoint decks uh, to make people in executive positions look good. And I look back on my career and couldn't point to one single thing that I could concretely say had been delivered. And mm. it's both really dissatisfying as a, as a designer because, you know, I think all designers have a slightly God complex. We want to see our things living in the world. But it's also not a, an effective industry if that is the, the product of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, what do you think would have to change in order to change this? So I think we all want to make impact. We all want to change the world for the better yeah i mean I, obviously i would say this but i would say getting more designers in-house so i think you know there's a perception potentially that uh, amongst designers who work in agencies that um, you're not going to get to work on the variety of stuff that you do in the agency world and um, uh, you know, that potentially it might be slower, um, various other kind of rumors, which I think maybe were true, probably, you know, kind of um, eight or so years ago. Definitely not true now. I mean, there's no bigger variety than of, of types of things to work on than government. Everything, you know, from kind of bin collections to, you know, kind of uh, social housing um, to land management and animals. I, take your pick. Um, mm -hmm. And I think... There, there needs to be a, a real kind of um, growth in terms of uh, the, the industry as a, as a whole, actually acknowledging that, um, you know, my, my role as, uh, you know, kind of head of service design for government is not as a client to agencies. It's as a person who runs uh, their own internal um, design organization. I think there's still a real uh, kind of um, perception and uh, I suppose sort of slightly, you know, kind of looking down on, on, on people who work in uh, in-house uh, by people who work in, in agencies. And I think if I'm perfectly honest, I think their days are numbered. And um, I think we're going to start seeing more and more designers, I hope move into organizations and move right to the, the kind of coal face of, of delivery and um, actually start uh, kind of delivering on some of the promises that, that service design has always promised. And it's super interesting. And I, what I see happening, or at least what I'm getting from your story, and I recognize this from our own practice, we've been doing this for 10 years. So often it's, uh, it, it's still like uh, there's an agency and there's a client instead of what should in my opinion, should be uh, a partnership. So an agency is supporting something that is already happening uh, on the client side. 
Mm. Uh, I think that's a much healthier situation, but for that you, you need clients that are more mature and that have their own yeah. in-house capabilities, right? Yeah, and I think also you need agencies that are more mature as well. I mean, I think um, it's a little bit like the, the um, well, in, in Britain there's a, there's a kind of analogy that dentists always have the worst teeth. <laughs> Um, because you know and I think it's the same for service design agencies always are the worst designed <laughs> in terms of the service they provide to their clients and I, I you know I can count the numbers of uh, service design agencies that ever done any user research with their clients on you know kind of one hand <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's a very rare thing to do and actually you know and you know we've often been in a situation where we need extra people and we need them very quickly to work on very certain kind of things at that point Yes, we do need to work with an agency, but you know, I've been in situations where um, I'm having a conversation with that agency, and I'm, you know, someone's telling me that it needs to take six months to do, and they need a ten-person team, and that ten-person team are not going to work in my office, and they're going to work in a completely different way to the way that we we always work, you know. I, and I think that there's a real upping of the game that agencies need to do to actually treat themselves as they would. The projects they work on and, and actually go you know what what do, what are the user needs of of my service that i provide as an agency so <clears throat> super interesting um i always have a question um and or at least i always give my guests the opportunity to ask a question to the people who are listening or watching these episodes is there a thing you'd like to ask them I, I would be interested to know um, if, if potentially people have the same prediction um, about the service design industry kind of moving more in, in house um, is, is true. I, I mean, it's certainly kind of true from from my anecdotal kind of experience of looking at other large organisations. But um, I think I, you know I'd, I'd ask that question, and I and I would ask the people you know kind of analyse their own practice and their own skills and start to think about if that is the case what is it that they need to start doing in order to be able to kind of work in, in those sorts of environments? What is it that if they're running a design education organization, what is it they need to start teaching and to really start analyzing that and, and to kind of, I think we're now at a point in, in kind of the maturity of the service design industry to start, you know, kind of really looking at our practice and, and, and sort of, thinking about the next phase of it rather than um, potentially the kind of where, where, 10 years ago, which was really just making the case for service design to happen. Mm. We had a, a point of scale and sustainability and delivery, and that means a whole set of uh, kind of uh, skills. So I think I, I would, maybe it's not quite a kind of question, but it's more just a sort of ask to, to people to, to kind of go in and think about what they're doing and, and whether or not um, uh, they're, they're doing what they need uh, in order to be able to kind of uh, meet that, that next phase of service design. I, I think this this new wave of scaling service design is uh, what makes this field so interesting because uh, 10 years ago we were like sort of inventing what was happening and uh, how we should communicate this and what, what it is we actually do. And now we have a whole sort of new challenges and that, for me that's what makes this field so interesting. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And I and think what's, what's really interesting is actually that I've seen in the last... Um, three years second, certainly in, in government is actually the conversation has moved on from my having to convince people um, that service design is important to uh, almost having to kind of do the opposite <laughs> of, of saying, you know, well, yes, it's, you know, um, you know, designing the services is, is of course the, the right way of doing it and, and having service designers working on it is, is the right thing to do. But that isn't going to change overnight and, you know, it, it will take time and the, you know, service design is not a silver bullet that you can just apply the service design and then it will suddenly things will be better. And I think um, that's a conversation that we need that needs to be had about um, actually, you know, what what are the realistic promises of, of service design um, so that we don't become in a way potentially what agile um in some places has become which is a kind of people have a sort of methodology fatigue you know before agile there was prince 2 and before prince 2 i'm sure there were a billion other things and what we don't want is service design to become the new methodology that promised the world and delivered nothing mm -hmm. um, and and i think part of that is actually focusing on on actual delivery rather than on methodology um uh for service designs so 
and and I, I, I this refers back to the the guest who was on the previous episode, Hartmut Esslinger, who who said that the problem with uh, design thinking and service design is often that there are no consequences when results are not delivered, and yeah. that that is a real big, well, it's a real big task and challenge we should take upon ourselves as an industry. Yeah, completely. I mean, if you look at any other industry, if they just didn't deliver the things that they said they were going to deliver, then yeah, and it, it's, it, it's, not, no it's, it's not good enough for us to, to be satisfied with doing a two-day workshop or just doing the research, you know, and I fully agree with you on that. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think you can really tell when you, you know, look at service design conferences, how many people are, are actually showing real results and statistics of, you know, like this change from this to this versus the, the number of people who show the process uh, and some diagrams and I just don't, I, I don't think that's good enough. I don't think it's good enough personally for those people to accept that of themselves. I don't think it's good enough for uh, design conferences to keep promoting that type of work. And I certainly don't think it's good enough for um, universities to start teaching people or keep teaching people that that is good enough. Um, but there's a real gap in our knowledge, I think, as a practice on what service design as a delivery based practice actually looks like. I mean, certainly something we've been doing for the last two years, but I, where is the shared knowledge around people who are also doing that in, in other organizations? Um, we, we might do a separate episode on that. Sounds super I, interesting. I think you should. <laughs> a delivery-based practice, right? That's what you called it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Hmm. Luis, thanks for your time. Thanks for taking the time uh, to share your thoughts and ideas about where service design is heading. It was really, for me, it was really valuable. Good, yeah, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. So what is your biggest takeaway from this episode? Share your thoughts and ideas down below in the comments. And remember, more people like you are watching these episodes and your comment might just be the thing that helps someone to achieve his next meaningful breakthrough. If you're interested in learning more, check out some of the past episodes or head over to learn.servicedesignshow.com where you'll find courses by leading service design experts that dig deeper into the topics we talk about on the show. I'll see you in two weeks time with a brand new episode. Thanks for watching and see you then.